Hello and welcome to my channel if this is the first video of mine that you are watching, but if it is not, welcome back. I'm in a slightly different locale today because I wanted to set up where you could see some of my spooky Halloween and autumnal decorations. So I hope you enjoy the slight change of scenery for this video and perhaps the next couple of videos too. Before I dive into this video, I do want to say that if you don't follow me over on Instagram, you might have missed a small announcement, I guess I made, that I think I'm gonna be scaling my uploads back for the next couple of weeks, just with the contract that I'm currently working and the amount of hours and the varying hours that I am working. It's really hard to commit to weekly uploads and I haven't been doing weekly uploads for the last month and a bit. So I think until the end of this year, I'm going to try and aim to upload one video every two weeks. And I think that will be much more feasible for me and will alleviate some of the pressure I've been putting on myself. So bi-weekly uploads for the remainder of 2024 and today's upload is going to be talking about the books that I read in September, the books I'm currently reading, and then the books I hope to read in October. So without further ado, let's dive right into the book. Starting with the first book that I finished in September, which is Furies of Calderon by Jim Butcher. And I did touch a little bit on my thoughts about this book in my previous monthly wrap up. But I did enjoy Furies of Calderon, which is the first book in the Codex Alera series. However, it was written by Butcher in the early 2000s. And if you have read The Dresden Files, you know that the way Butcher writes women now has improved tremendously from the beginning of his career, which is so lovely to see an author progress and get better at the craft. But diving into a book of Butcher's from the early 2000s and the way that he characterizes and writes women was a little bit of a shock because I was wrongly expecting to dive into um, a book that features the way he writes women now. And I will say the women in Furies of Calderon weren't amazingly written. There were some strong female characters, but it was very binary. There's a lot of violence and gore that takes place in this book. And almost all of it takes place to women, like women are the victims in that scenario, whether it's rape or slavery or other horrific, horrific acts. Every example that I'm thinking of right now features a women, woman as the victim and not always were ma male characters the savior, but quite frequently male characters were the savior figure. So that wasn't the best fun to read, I would say. I enjoyed Furies of Caltron, and I really appreciate the way that Butcher wrapped up this book's antagonist and this book's story arc while setting the stage for the future books because this is the beginning of the series and I believe there are seven, six books within the Codex Alera, seven or six books. So I do think that I might continue on with this series. It's not going to be one that I prioritize tremendously, unless someone down below tells me that this is the best series they've ever read, then maybe I'll prioritize it a little bit more. But currently I think I'm just going to keep an eye out for it at the library or secondhand book sales and maybe continue on with the series that way. Luna Shirley. We had a rascal getting into things. Are you gonna calm down or no? Are you gonna stay on my lap? 
The next book that I read in September was Ruin and Rising by Lee Bardugo, which is the third book in the Shadow and Bone trilogy. And I'm so happy that I have now finally finished this trilogy and I really enjoyed it. I thought Ruin and Rising was a really satisfying way to conclude this trilogy and I... The ending was a little bit kitschy, but I kind of loved it and I found it just so endearing after following along with these characters for the last three books. If you've watched any of my previous monthly wrap-ups, you'll know that I wasn't fully invested in this trilogy until about this third book. And I think that is just part and parcel because the books have been out for a relatively long period of time at this point and I kind of already knew and had heard of all of the twists and turns that take place in this series. So there was nothing that really shocked me even in the third book in this final book. There was nothing that took me aback or by surprise but that said I still enjoyed it for what it was and I think I gave Ruin and Rising three and a half stars. Overall, I enjoyed it. And I think I am going to continue on with King of Scars because if I have understood correctly, I believe the crows feature in King of Scars, that duology. And I read The Six of Crows first and I absolutely adored it. So I would love to see and revisit those characters again. Then the next book that I read in September was 10,000 Stitches by Olivia Atwater. And I have absolutely been loving just chipping away at Atwater's bibliography and reading about a book a month for the last three months, I think. 10,000 Stitches is the second book in the Regency Fairy Tales series by Atwater. And these are Regency romances that take place in an alternate reality where Fae exist and coexist with humanity. It's a really fun, whimsical take on a particular subgenre of romance historical that I absolutely adore. These are, I would say, quite light romances. They're closed door. I would say maybe they're even young adult. They're quite just cutesy, but I find that to just be a great palette cleanser, a very entertaining, quick, fast paced read that I don't have to think too hard about. And I've been loving the small little anecdotes that are woven throughout Atwater's books about family and love and friendship and loyalty and just all of those really heartwarming, endearing themes and tropes. I believe that I gave 10,000 Stitches four stars. It wasn't quite a five star read but I really really enjoyed it and I will be continuing on with this series. There is a third book in the series that I believe is a female female romance so hopefully I'll be able to get that from the library in October or November and that I'll enjoy it as much as I have enjoyed the first two books in this series. My next read was another quick, fast paced one, and that was The Governess Affair by Courtney Milan, which is a novella, and it is a prequel to her brother's Sinister series. So this one was really quick. I believe it's only a hundred pages or so. However, what Milan was able to pack into this book is incredibly impressive. I will say that if you are interested in reading this novella, which Milan recommends you read before you begin her brother's Sinister series, is that there are themes and discussions surrounding rape in this novella as well as pregnancy as a result of said rape. And those two topics are ones that I'm quite sensitive to, but I would say that the way Milan handled those themes and topics in The Governess Affair 
are some of the best examples that I think I've read in recent memory. Obviously, with only 100 pages to work with, it is a very simplified and perhaps idealized version in which the best case scenario happens. But I still think that the way Milan discussed the act and the aftermath felt more realistic than I have seen some authors utilize those themes and tropes with double, triple, quadruple the number of pages to work with. So The Governess Affair. I believe I gave this read four and a half or five stars just because I was so impressed with how immersive this world was with only 100 pages, with how kind of fleshed out the characters were for a novella. I was really impressed with the world that was created and I'm not sure when I'll get a chance to continue on with the Brothers Sinister series, but Courtney Malone is definitely an author that I've read a few books by and The Governess Affair was definitely a testament that I'd love to read more of their bibliography. Then the penultimate book that I read in September was Prisoners of Geography, 10 Maps That Explain Everything About the World by Tim Marshall. This book has been on my TBRs for the last two or three months and I just wasn't really in the mood for nonfiction over the last little while, but I finally sat down and read this book and I thought it was fantastic. I believe I gave Prisoners of Geography five stars. This was a very approachable nonfiction book. There are some nonfiction books that are written with much drier text and that are a little bit more of a slog to get through. However, the tone that Marshall uses throughout this book is very conversational. Therefore, it didn't take me that long to read at all. And I love how it felt very much like you were having a conversation with Marshall. There was wit throughout this book he has a very dry humor, at least that's what came through within Prisoners of Geography. And I think that contrasted really nicely with some really difficult subject matter uh, surrounding colonialism and war and political and racial tensions and kind of what we're currently living in. This was published in 20... 13, I believe. So some of the events that he predicts might take place have taken place and some of the stuff he talks about happening might still happen. So I know that there are more books within this similar vein from Marshall and he has revisited Prisoners of Geography within a more contemporary setting now that it has been a decade since it was first published. So I'm really interested to read more by Marshall just because I found him to be incredibly informative. I really liked his approach, his tone, and the way that he conveyed information. So this was five star read for me. As well, something that I experimented with in September, which I'll get into a little bit more in a bit, is annotating my books. I am someone who for years and years has been very anti-annotating books. Even in university, I remember the first time I underlined something in a textbook. I did it in pencil just because I didn't want to mark up the book that I had paid a lot of money for. But I'm experimenting. I'm trying something new. And I actually really have been enjoying it. I didn't expect that I would enjoy it quite so much. Um, but yeah, it's been a really good way to consume the information that I'm reading in a slightly different way, in a slightly different light. And yeah, if you are someone who has very, who has always been very anti annotating, 
maybe give it a try with a book with less stakes, like a nonfiction book. I felt like this was a really good one to ease my way back in because it felt a little bit like I was back in university. But yes, Prisoners of Geography, if you're looking for a good nonfiction book about why countries have the borders that they do. TLDR, a lot of it was colonialism and is colonialism, but if you're looking for a slightly more in-depth look at that, I would recommend The Prisoners of Geography book by Tim Marshall here. Then the final book that I read in September was the perfect book to close out the month and lead me into spooky season and my October TBR, and that was Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. In addition to being on my September TBR, Gideon the Ninth was on my 24 for 2024 TBR, so I'm making some progress on that much bigger TBR for the rest of the year, but I loved Gideon the Ninth. This ending, broke me and made me somewhat giddy and just happy and oh it was so 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 good. If you've read this book you know what I'm talking about but Gideon the Ninth is a book about necromancy and it's a little bit of a quest book. You have these characters who have been pulled into almost a haunted mansion setting except there are skeletons and it's really a fight for their life. The description on the back here says that it is a solar system of swordplay, cutthroat politics, and lesbian necromancers. It took me a little bit to get into this book and I think that is in part because I was switching back and forth between the audiobook and the physical copy and there is a very specific tone that Muir has in this book. So it took me a little bit to kind of immerse myself in this world, but once I did, I loved Gideon. I grew to appreciate Harrow, and I'm really looking forward to reading Harrow the Ninth, which is the next book in this series. I think I gave Gideon the Ninth four stars, but this I would say was a fantastic book to read during the autumnal months and in the lead up to Halloween. I think this would be a great option. It is, I think it's upper YA. It's technically a young adult book, but I would <laughs> say that it's on the older end of young adult, kind of on the cusp of new adult. There isn't any sexual content within this book, but some of the descriptions of death and murder are quite gruesome and grotesque, and there is a whole lot of foul language throughout, which I personally absolutely love. I would say if you have read The Lies of Locke Lamora, the tone of this book and some of the descriptions are quite similar to Scott Lynch's The Lies of Locke Lamora. And I think that is partially why I absolutely loved Gideon the Ninth so much. So those were the books that I read throughout September. And now onto the books that I am currently reading, which I began kind of at the end of September and have carried over into these first few days of October. But top priority for me is The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. This was on my September TBR, but I think it was a little bit lofty that I wanted to finish this book in addition to a few other chunky books. So I'm not very far into it just yet. I am on chapter eight, but it's been so nice returning to the world of the Stormlight Archive in preparation for Wind and Truth coming out this December. And similar to Prisoners of Geography, I have been annotating this paperback, mass market paperback copy of The Way of Kings. And I do have a little like annotation key here for the different colored highlighters I've been using. So I've been trying to 
highlight foreshadowing description that I absolutely adore, quotes that I love, and then symbolism that I think was quite poignant or is going to become quite important for the later books. And it's really nice revisiting this book, like I said. And even though this is my fourth reread, I think, I feel as if I'm still finding new bits in the book, or at least like the bits that are sticking out to me have changed with each read. So yes, this is just an example of some highlighting I've done and some underlining, more highlighting down here. I will say I don't love the colors that I chose because this blue is quite light. It's very hard to pick it up when I am flipping through. And then the other blue I chose is really dark and it kind of makes the text a little bit hard to read but I did kind of go with colors that appear on the cover because I am who I am. But yes, so I'm currently reading The Way of Kings and I'll definitely be able to finish this throughout the month of October and then I will carry on reading the, the series in anticipation of the fifth book coming out in December. The second book that I'm currently reading is Queen of Shadows by Sarah J. Mass, which is the fourth book in the Throne of Glass series. And this hold came through the library and I couldn't resist taking it out and starting it. I believe I'm only maybe three or four chapters in at the moment. And this one is a little bit longer, but I will definitely finish this before the end of the month and not just because my library hold will be due before the end of the month. But similar to the Shadow and Bone series, this series, Throne of Glass, is one that has taken me a little bit to really get into and to really care for the characters. And similarly, I think it is because just these books have been out for so long. I've already encountered most of the spoilers online, so I knew all of the twists and turns. So it took me until the third book to really care for these characters. I think I ended up still giving the third book three stars, maybe. I gave it four stars just because I enjoyed it finally, but yes, it has taken me a while to warm up to these characters and really come, become invested in their plight and their journey, but I'm there now, so I'm excited to see what takes place in the fourth book. And I think this is the first book in which I genuinely am excited to see where things go. Like I'm finally in it. So we will see how I get on with Queen of Shadows, but I'll be sure to let you know at the end of the month. And then the third book that I'm currently reading, and I don't know who I have become. I used to be someone who could only read one book at a time. And then I started reading different formatted books at a time. I remember this was a journey on my Instagram page and it was someone on Bookstagram who recommended to me like read a physical copy of a book and an audiobook and that's much easier to split your attention between and now suddenly I'm someone who is reading two or three books at a time and back when I was younger when I was a teenager I used to do this all the time I would have a fantasy book on the go a mystery book a historical fiction book like I could flit between genres like nobody's business and I kind of feel like I'm coming back to teenage me so that's been a fun part of my re reading journey this year but the third book that I'm currently reading I started on audiobook but I have the physical copy and that is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, which is another book on my 24 for 2024 TBR. So I'm excited to finally begin this one too. It won the Man Booker Prize back in 2009. So I am very, very late to this bandwagon as is often the case with the books that I pick up. I'm usually so far behind the trend, but I'm excited to finally begin this series. It was recommended to me back in, I think 2015 
by a history professor when I was in university taking a French Revolution course. He recommended Mantel for her really rich, immersive writing and the way she brings history to life in a really realistic and true to the source way. So I am excited to read Wolf Hall. We are following Thomas Cromwell and the very beginning of this book picks up with him as a young man, as a young boy. I think he's like, he's younger than 15, I believe, or he's in his young teens. And we are witnessing him kind of begin his journey and having a little bit of a glimpse into what motivates him. So again, I'm only a couple of chapters in, but I can already tell that I'm really going to enjoy Wolf Hall. So I'm looking forward to reading this one throughout the rest of October too. So with me already reading The Way of Kings, Queen of Shadows, and Wolf Hall, those are fairly chunky books. Like this is just Wolf Hall and The Way of Kings. I have an ebook of Queen of Shadows from my library out at the moment. But this is already quite a few pages to try and read throughout the rest of October. So the other books that I have on my October TBR are a little bit shorter and there's not very many of them really. The first book on my October TBR is one that was initially on my September TBR as well and that is Can't Spell Treason Without Tea by Rebecca Thorne. This is a cozy fantasy steeped with love. And for me personally, there is just something quintessentially autumnal about a cozy fantasy. It just depicts what I wish to do during the autumn months, which is just curl up on a cozy armchair with a book in front of a fireplace or a faux fireplace and just get comfy and prepare for the winter months. So I think that this will be a really good October read for me because typically I am not someone who particularly enjoys a gruesome horror or the like. So this will be a really nice, quick, fast paced fantasy read that will hopefully make me feel all warm and cozy inside. Then the only other titles that I am putting on my October TBR are kind of the more quintessential spooky season reads because they are horror and they are volumes six through eight of the Revival series. So here we have volume six, Thy Loyal Sons and Daughters, volume seven, which is Forward, and volume eight, which is stay just a little bit longer. So these are the last three volumes in the series that I need to read. And as you can tell by the cover here, they are horror and they are kind of dark, gritty, urban sci-fi comics. I have already spoken at length, I would say, on my channel about this series, about these comics, which are written by Tim Seeley and illustrated by Mike Norton. But if you do not know what this comic book series is about, it takes place within rural Wisconsin, where for one day, January 2nd, anyone who dies comes back to life. So these are zombie, comics and we are following the aftermath of Revival Day on January 2nd where we have these people who have been revived, who are revivalists, and for the most part they seem to be pretty normal. They seem to look and act and behave just like the mothers, fathers, daughters, neighbors they were on January 1st. However, then weird things start happening and there are signs of superhuman strength that they are exhibiting and suddenly it becomes a little bit of a fight for your life against these revivalists. 
So the main characters that we are following are Dana, who is a police officer within the county of Oiseau, her father, who is the police chief, as well as her sister, M, and we are also following a CDC officer, Ibrahim. So that's our main cast of characters, and we are following along with them as they try to figure out what the heck happened, why the heck it happened, and what the absolute heck do they do now. I have found this series to be incredibly entertaining. It is a product of its era. It was written in the mid 2010s. So similar to Furies of Calderon, the way that the female characters are depicted is not something that I would expect from something published in 2024, but for being a product of its era, for having a lot of violence done to and against women, it's an interesting concept to me, and there were finally some twists and turns in Volume 5 that I was not expecting. So I am looking forward to reading these final volumes and figuring out really what happened. And I am so eager to see how Seely and Norton complete this series. But yes, I'm hoping to finish the revival series in October as well. And with the horror-esque elements of this series, I think this is going to be a very fitting read throughout October. But those are the books that I read in September, the books that I am currently reading, and then the books that I hope to read throughout October. If you have read any of the books that I've spoken about today, please let me know down in a comment below because I'd love to chat with you about them. But for now, that is it for me. Thank you very much for watching this video and I will be back soon with a new one. Bye for now.